The internet has been a buzz for the last 48 hours after the Society for Human Resource Management announced last week that it dropped the word equity from its diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. They set off a bomb in the relatively uh, quiet world of corporate HR. The shift critics are calling it a retreat, not just a shift, but a full-blown retreat. And they said comes as some companies are backing away from the diversity strategies launched a few years ago in the work of George Floyd's murder. And they say this is as a result of a barrage of attacks on companies by conservatives and Republican lawmakers. Uh, just last week, CNN disbanded its race and equity reporting group. And last month, Tractor Supply, an 86-year-old rural retailer, announced it would end its DEI and environmental practices entirely. And today we heard Republicans saying that the reason Donald Trump was shot was because that the Secret Service uh, is headed by a female and that they had a DEI mandate to increase uh, its uh employees, the number of folks who are Secret Service uh, agents by 30% to get to 30% of women uh, as agents. So we see DEI getting blamed for just about everything, including the shooting attempt by a 20-year-old white man uh, of the former president. I am super excited to be joined in this hour by uh, two experts, two folks who know a whole lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, returning to the show is Mary Frances Winter. She is the best-selling author of Black Fatigue, How Racism Erodes the Mind, Body, and Spirit. And we can't talk about that at work, how to talk about race, religion, politics, and other polarizing topics. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of the Winters Group, and she's been named one of the top 10 diversity and inclusion trailblazers by Forbes uh, magazine. It's been in the news itself because of uh, its retraction of an article written by another DEI expert, Dr. Sean Harper. Uh, and also in this hour is one of our uh, returning uh, regular experts, Dr. Omikanga Dabinga. He's a, a senior professional lecturer at American University, also a DEI expert, uh, teaches DEI uh, strategies to companies around the world, uh, has also written a book about race. So these are two of the, the top folks in the DEI space. Welcome uh, back, Mary Francis. Welcome, Dr. Dabinga. Always a pleasure to be in conversation with both of you. I want to start with you, Dr. Dabinga. So Johnny Taylor, he's an African-American lawyer, CEO of the Society for Human Resource Management. He has come under fire. Uh, the backlash on social media has been intense. Uh, folks don't understand his reasoning. He says that the word diversity is misunderstood and divisive. So somehow dropping the word, he I don't know, kind of, kind of lot, illogically concludes that it will create less division in the workplace. But, but what do you make of this bombshell announcement by the Society for Human Resource Management? I'll be honest, I, I really couldn't believe it. I mean, it was so, so disappointing to watch organization after organization or school after school that I'm working with, or even some of the companies do these little steps that they think are little steps, but are really major when you start to see the backlash from people who need to have these terms and hear these words to feel like they are part of some type of community, to have, the, have them pull back like that. A lot of people uh, had, had respect for what Sherm was doing as it relates to diversity initiatives. And this is, our, as you talked about it in your intro, the way that Republicans are coming at DEI in every way, shape, and form, this is a time for all of us are, who do this work or who appreciate this work are supposed to stand up. Look, even the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the term has changed over the years, it's expanded. You know, the DEI has always been about expansion and inclusion. You know, decade, 15 years ago, whenever, people weren't having conversations about trans people or, or even the LGBTQ community in the same way that we are today when these, you know, you know so, you know, people incorporating ageism and ableism and speaking up more about that. Uh, people who are part of the what some many call the disability community, making sure that people were going against words like retarded and understanding how ignorant and disrespectful that was. Like these are things that got added to the conversations about DEI. So DEI is supposed to be expansive. It's not supposed to shrink. And the idea of removing a word because people are arguing over the definitions, DEI is all about allowing people to define themselves and building communities together. So to run away from that, I feel is very disrespectful and problematic. 
So help us understand, uh, Mary Frances, uh, what a big deal the Society for Human Resource Management is, because some folks may be thinking, OK, well, who are they and why is this important that that uh, they made this pronouncement and why are people up in arms? So give us the context of who this organization is and what they represent for corporate America. Yeah, it's really good to be back. Good to see you. 340,000 members. Wow. So it's big and it is global. It's not just the United States. It's headed by a black man. Johnny Taylor is a black man. He's been at the helm for a number of years now. Sherm, um, Sherm as it's affectionately called, Society of Human Sherm, was one of my clients uh, for many years um, back in the early um, 2000s. And yes, um, they did have a very strong uh, platform around diversity, equity, and inclusion um, uh, back then. Uh, I think that um, it is it is a big deal. And I don't know that this is going to go you know, his way, because as you said, the uh, social media um, is just, you know, has uh, up in arms about this. And it's, it's interesting because he said that they've done some kind of research which shows that the equity in DEI is the problem. And um, I that's just not sitting with me in terms of what I'm doing with, uh, with my clients because we talk about equity, as the professor just did, that it is inclusive and expansive. And we are talking about creating a society that will work for more people. I think that, um, you know, DEI has been called uh, by some of the far right as didn't earn it. And so, and so there's this, this notion that, um, you know, that, that there's, it's the zero sum game, this notion that um, people who have been disenfranchised uh, for years and years and years are trying to, um, you know, reap some kind of benefit that they, that they don't deserve. The other thing that we have to think about is the demographics. Only 34% of this country, the United States, only 34% are white men. And so it is a society of black and brown people. We are the global majority. And it is, you know, a society of women. Women represent, you know, 50% of the population. And so it's about power and it's about, it's about uh, maintaining power. And I wonder, I don't know this for sure, if Johnny Taylor is, you know, kind of hedging his bets because depending on who wins this election, Right. Um, he wants to be he wants to be in. And, you know, he has, um, you know, he has shown that he, you know, has been bipartisan in the past, but he's also shown partisan partisanship in the past as well. What is what has he shown when you say he's shown to be partisan? I well, mean, um, he, he has, um, you know, he's been at a, a, he's been at a lot of uh, functions with Donald Trump when Donald Trump was uh, in office. Oh. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah. Um, all I'm saying, and you know, money, obviously this is about power. This is about, this is about money. It's a membership organization. And um, I think that, you know, he's hedging his bets, but when we talk about equity, we are absolutely talking about, so people, he said in his um, post, you know, well, it's really about equality and equity. We cannot have equality unless we have equity first. So equity has to come first to get to equality. We have so many disparities, disparities in healthcare, disparities in workplace. Black women, uh, black women's um, equal pay day was July 9th. Black women make 69 cents to the dollar of every non-Hispanic white man. Mm. White women make 83 cents to the dollar of every, um, there he is, yeah, of every, um, non-Hispanic um, white man. And so we have lots of inequities that continue. We were trying to figure out what the connection uh, with Johnny Taylor, perhaps, and Donald Trump is. So we found a couple of things, thanks to the internet. Uh, we know he was appointed to the advisory council that Donald Trump set up for HBCUs back in 2018. That's when Donald Trump was uh, saying that he was allocating $500 million to HBCUs. Important to note that Joe Biden has since made a pronounce, uh, an announcement of $16 billion, not million, mm -hmm. billion dollars for HBCUs. Uh, another article I found, this is just from uh, 20 as well, uh, says talent leaders say the world's largest HR organization whiffed on defending Black Americans. The CEO says that he represents all workers and that the business world is just waking up to a problem he's known his own life. Uh, and this is after George Floyd was murdered. Uh, a lot of criticism of him. 
again, close ties to Donald Trump. Uh, so I don't know if this pronouncement, Dr. Dominguez, is all that shocking. If you, you know, we got to do a little deep dive on who Mr. Taylor is. Seems like his politics are perfectly aligned with uh, Donald Trump and Republicans because, I mean, you just go article to article, he is not afraid to be publicly uh, aligned with him. That's disappointing because I presume this is a nonpartisan organization, as, as uh, Mary Frances said, but we know that that's not always the case. Yeah, and I, I want to say also it's just an honor to be on uh, with Mary Frances as well. So much respect for everything that uh, that that you've done over the years. Um, look, it's still disappointing because when you look at say affirmative action, for you know, for example, you know, one of the people who helped co-write their affirmative action, uh, you know, policies was a black Republican, right? But my my point is that regardless of your affiliation, you're supposed to stand with your base of people. And SHRM is an organization that has always talked about proudly its commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It has issued reports that talked about how companies that were more diverse were more profitable. And it's been something that they always stood on. And so, and just to get rid of one word, and look, we can find something divisive about the term diversity. We can find something divisive about the term inclusion as well. And this idea that people don't know what it means, therefore it's divisive. That's why in my book, Lies About Black People, I put a glossary in the back of the book so we can take basic Webster's, Merriam, whatever dictionary you want, get one dictionary you agree on and pick definitions for the simplest terms, right? You can find, you can all agree on the term equity. It's right there, right? And so this idea that people don't know what it means, your job is to teach people what it means and to shy away from that is disappointing. Yes, the, you know, the Trump relationship makes it a little bit more problematic, but look, this is why I get concerned about where we are as a society today because democracy does not die in darkness. It dies in the light of day. And it dies because people acquiesce, they give up their power. And we so we got what we the rights we earned in the 60s because people were willing to give up their not to not give up their their what they believed were their God-given rights and are willing to die for it. And I just don't see that same level of fervor what's happening right now because I feel some of us are just way too comfortable. And so we have no problem making these quiet concessions here and there, but it's destroying our community and it's destroying what we fought for for so long. Yeah, I, I looked up equity and anyone can look it up. I mean, the simplest word for equity is just fairness, uh, Mary Francis. So uh, you've been inside so many of these corporations, including this one. What is dividing people over the word fairness? Well, let me give let me give you an example of what equity equity is. So there's a think of a dot think of child, three children trying to see a baseball game, and um, one child is really short, and the other tall child is tall, and the third child is in a wheelchair. Okay, there you go, there you go. All right, we got it right here. And so equality would say we're gonna give everybody the same thing, right? But everybody doesn't need the same thing to be able to see the baseball game. So e equity is about giving people what they need in order to succeed. Mm -hmm. And um, as the professor said, we can think about that with people with disabilities. Um, you know, the cutouts that, that you see in a, in, a, in a curb, in a sidewalk, think about that. The disability community advocated for those cutouts because the wheel, people in wheelchairs couldn't get over the curbs, right? But that not only helps people who are trying to, who are, who are in wheelchairs, it helps uh, families with, with a stroller. It helps uh, a delivery person who has a, you know, a cart. So it helps everyone. So when we think about equity, equity is about giving everybody what they need to succeed and everybody doesn't need the same thing. So if we have equity, then we have equality. So people, you know, you, we can use the words interchangeably. I, I don't care. But the point is, is that giving people what they need to succeed, we found if the, the tech community found that people um, uh, with autism actually had specific skills, fine motor skills that help them. Um, I'm not going to get too far along with this, but to, that help them in manufacturing and putting uh, and putting products and putting products together uh, because they're of the concentration. And so everybody has something to contribute. But if we just say it's a meritocracy, 
and one size fits all. And if you don't fit in, well, you know, too bad. Then that weakens our entire world. Is, is that what you believe? The, the elimination of the E out of DEI is an effort on the part of Taylor and his organization to say this is a meritocracy. Everybody pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We're all going to start wherever we start. Doesn't matter if you're in a wheelchair. Doesn't matter right. if you're five feet tall. Doesn't matter if you're six feet. Is that right. what you think? I think so, because if we if we have include so we can talk about inclusion, right? Look, everybody's included. Come on, you everybody come to the party. We're having a party. Everybody come to the party. Uh, well, you know, um, Sam is in a wheelchair, right? And this where the party is, there's no accessibility for wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you invited Sam. Well, I'm including Sam, but Sam can't get there. So if we don't focus on equity and the inequities, and, you know, let's think today, we, we didn't talk 10, 15 years ago about neurodiversity. I have people on my team who have ADHD. I have people on my team who have dys dyslexia. And there are, there's software now to support that. But it, heretofore, people would be fired because someone with dyslexia, well, you can't do the what's, what's wrong with you? You can't do the job. You didn't have the tools. We call these things in law, as you well know, Reva, reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. And that's what equity is about. And so if you take that away, um, if you take the E away, the I and the D don't work. As a matter of fact, I think the D ought to be first, because if you don't have diversity, there's no need for inclusion. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting because I'm sitting here thinking what really does Sherm, you know, what, what is the society really saying to this 340,000 members uh, that are part of the organization. What what pass are they giving these companies? Are they saying to companies like uh, this, you know, tractor supply company, literally you can just do away with all of your DEI strategies because if you start to water it down, uh, eliminating the equity piece, as you said, you know, you've got some terms, but you have an empty shell that's not going to do anything to promote people in the workplace or to ensure the same uh, level of opportunities for folks. So what we're looking for, I want to talk about what happens now. If companies, the 340,000 corporations that are members uh, of this professional organization say, OK, well, you know, uh, Society for Human Resource Management said we don't have to do equity anymore. So let's go rewrite all of our strategies around this. Let's fire all of the folks who have the title as your know, DEI directors or managers because we don't need them anymore. Let's talk about how big of a shift, change, and retreat do we expect this bombshell news to have on corporate America? And then we know it'll follow in terms of, you know, nonprofit world, the government, uh, which in some ways is leading, or Donald Trump said, will lead on this issue. You guys uh, have your finger on the pulse of what's happening <laughs> in this country around this topic. And you know, Mary Frances, you said DEI has DEI now is called by Republicans or folks on the right as you know didn't earn it. But just about every topic that comes up, the shooting of the president somehow that's related to DEI. Uh, climate change somehow that's related to DEI. I, I saw someone talking about the weather, saying that what we see, you know, the, the storms and and those the rain that we're getting the excess excessive amount is somehow. Uh, related to DEI efforts. And you also said, Mary Frances, that the white men make up only 34% of the population, but we know they are disproportionately uh, over-indexed. They are over-indexed in positions of power. So even though they may not be the majority in terms of their numbers, their power, you know, corporate CEOs, corporate boards, uh, heads of organizations, you're going to find white men uh, and they after George Floyd's murder, I will brief racial reckoning period. The backlash mm -hmm. has been intense. Uh, Mary Francis, tell us what you know. What will happen if these three hundred forty thousand member organizations say, "Okay, well, you know, our leader said get rid of D, get rid of the equity in DEI," and they take a similar approach? What would that mean for people of color who are working in these uh, organizations? You know, I think like the professor said, um, you know, we, we've got to, we have to be strong and we really have to come out again and fight this. Um, and I think some of us have become uh, somewhat complacent. But I do believe that um, the majority of people who are part of this people in this organization, the individuals in this organization typically lead the HR function. So some people who lead the HR function are very much in tune with DEI. 
some people who lead the HR function are not at all, right? And so you've got you've got that going on. But I think that there are enough advocates for diversity, equity, and inclusion. You've got equity in schools. Equity is a term that has been used now for years to talk about children um, who uh, you know don't perform at the same the, the same level. They talk about equity, equity, health equity. Uh, we have several clients who are in in healthcare, and health equity is big because of the disproportionality of outcomes, health outcomes. We know that you know black women are twice as likely to die in, in childbirth. Those are those are equity issues, right? Those are not necessarily quote diversity issues that in the big picture they are, but we have to focus on equity. So yes, the great replacement theory is something that I think some white men are afraid of because we are the global majority, black and brown people are the global majority in, in the world. And they're seeing, you know, that's why immigration, that such an issue with immigration, because they know that they are not in the majority when it comes to numbers, but they are in power and they want to maintain that power. So I think that that's really what, what, uh, what this is really all about, maintaining power. They will not be happy, I don't think, until they eliminate. So they first came after the D, the diversity, right? Um, and now they're coming after the E and they haven't come after the I because it's kind of really hard to say, you know, I don't believe in inclusion, right? But I believe that they're gonna come after that um, uh, as well. But what that will do to our society is it absolutely will destroy um, our society because um, as the professor said earlier, or you said, um, we know from many, many studies that diversity absolutely um, increases the bottom line for organizations. These people don't care. They don't care, uh, Dr. Dabinga, that they make more money because they want to support white supremacy. But I do want to ask you this, Dr. Dabinga, and I'll get your take on this, Mary Francis. It feels like to me, every time we're having this conversation, we are having it from a position of reacting. Mm -hmm. We are not having it from a position of strength. We are not mm -hmm. mounting uh, the counter attack to the attacks on DEI. It just feels like we're sitting here waiting to see where the next frontier, college admissions, uh, you know, the fearless fund, the attack on the reparations program in Evanston, Illinois, uh, you know, now the elimination of the word equity across you know this big agency that represents all these corporations. So how do we get in control of this narrative, uh, Dr. Dominga, so that we're not just always responding to the really organized, and they are very organized, attacks uh, that we see around any efforts to make this country, to make the workplace uh, a more fair workplace? And this is part of my concern that I talked about in, in, in the last uh, segment that we did. It's, it's about organization, right? When the, the, the great organizer of the March on Washington, you know, Bayard Rustin, I saw an interview that he did in the 80s. And he said, you know, we, we protested because we didn't have the right to vote. When you, have the, when you have the vote, you don't need to protest, right? And too many of us are not, we're also not protesting and we're not voting to put in the representation needed. There are governors, you know, Oklahoma, different states that are banning DEI and banning, you know, uh, DeSantis with his anti quote unquote woke legislation, right? So we should be voting people in uh, at different levels in, in these states that, that have the power to make this change. We should be, you know, the NAACP and other organizations, the Urban League, they should be boycotting cities that are having DEI bans or, and some are, you know, are, are making changes, but, you know, our, our, our Divine Nine organizations, those types of things which are kind of caught, and I'm not saying everything, was, I'm not trying to romanticize everything in the past, but what I'm saying is that there were strategies that were in place, not just with the Montgomery bus boycott, that proved to be effective. And I feel like sometimes we get too comfortable in our spaces that we don't want to rock the boat. So we need an organizational um, activism from our different organizations. We need more political activism, letting people know that if you're really, because Ariva, this stuff is, is being, it's not, they're not one-offs. They're being, no. you know, what's happening with Sherm is being coupled with the kids not getting the history in the school. They were already not getting of it. Now the books are being banned. Then it's coupled with the colleges and what's happening with affirmative action. Then it's being coupled with, you know, you talked about everything being blamed on DEI. Let's not forget the the boat, the shipwreck in Baltimore that got blamed on, on DEI because there's a black governor and a black mayor of Baltimore. Uh, so 
they're gonna they are they have been more strategic in coming at us at every level and we have to be more strategic in our response and you know as the late joe madison said you know we have to be able to apply our dollars with it because he would always cite the late johnny cochran who would say if you hit people in their pocketbooks their hearts and minds will follow and we haven't done enough of that and that's one of the proactive measures we also need to take yeah, one thing I, I fear, uh, Mary Francis, is Johnny Taylor. He is an African American man, obviously. He has been selected by Donald Trump to sit on advisory boards when Donald Trump was in the White House. And we know that by having an African American person, in this case, a man, at the head of this organization, when we start talking about race and racism and systemic barriers, you know, they, they point to this man as an example of someone who's leading the charge. And if they say, if Johnny Taylor, a black man, says the equity needs to go, then, you know, of course the equity needs to go. It's the same way we're watching Tim Scott at the Republican National Convention. Uh, we just saw Amber Rose last night. So there are uh, these African American. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> she was there. So there, there are black people uh, that Republicans can point to and say, you know, they, they are the ones. So you black people who are complaining, you are race baiters, as uh, Joy Reid was called by Amber Rose, and that we are the ones that don't want to accept that merit is it plays a role, or we are the ones that are dividing the country, right? That word division that is divisive, that, that's a loaded word that Johnny Taylor used. What do you mean it's divisive? You know, that's like saying there's good, there's bad on both sides. You know, right. that's normalizing the conduct of racist and racism, you know, really minimizing the racism that still exists in corporate America. So when we come forward, I want to talk about how dangerous this is for this charge, not to just be led by this huge organization, but the organization is led by a black man. Does that legitimize for those folks who want to tell us that, you know, the civil rights movement is over. We need to get over it and you know deal with the reality that you know this country is not going to ever be uh, what we you know the, the vision that uh, folks have, civil rights leader had for this country is never going to be realized. Mary Francis, I worry that an African American man like Johnny Taylor, who is so well respected, obviously in corporate America in these uh, HR circles, when he says equity is misunderstood and divisive. Doesn't that give more fuel to those like Donald Trump and conservative Republicans, J.D. Vance and others to say that DEI has had its, uh, you know, has had its day and it's time to do away with the whole strategy and, and the whole concept? Because we also hear white people saying that it's racist and a form of racism to even promote uh, a DEI strategy. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, I think you're absolutely right. And the conversation that you were having before about the strategy and how uh, Dr. Dabingo was saying that um, they are very strategic. And you were saying that, indeed, I think the strategy actually started when President Obama was elected. And that strategy started at that time. We are not as strategic. Um, and I believe that we need to have, get black and brown people together, people with disabilities, people who are uh, the LGBTQ community, um, all of the groups who have been marginalized, who are underrepresented, who have been oppressed in our in our society, we all need to come together um, for with a strategy. We are we are divided because that's the way they would they want us to be, you know, divided. Uh, we have not yet found someone who who's going to be that uh, who's going to do that bringing together. Uh, of all of these groups, but I think that that's the way that we're going to be able to to fight this because we have common we have common concerns around ex exclusion. Our our issues are not all the same, but there are a bunch of core issues that we have that we need to coalesce around. We had a um, the Winters Group had a summit in April, and we had people from the trans community, we had people from the uh, disability community, we had people obviously from the black community, we had people from the Latin, Latinx community. And we came together to talk about um, what some of our common common issues are. But we need a coalition of people who are going to come together. We're always going to have the naysayers. We're always going to have, you know, what they say, all skin folk, <laughs> not kin folk, right? And so, but that's diversity, right? We have, we have, you know, we have diversity of diversity of thought. And so just because somebody is black doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be supportive of 
diversity, equity, um, and inclusion. Their lived experience may have may have been different. I, I don't know. But I do believe that unless we come together with the various constituency groups um, that have experienced racism and sexism and homophobia in this country, we're not going to succeed. How hopeful are you, uh, Dr. Dabinga, of this coalition building of folks coming together, particularly thinking about white women? So uh, Ann Coulter, conservative media pundit who uh, is promoting a petition calling for the firing of Kimberly Cheadle. Uh, Cheadle is the head of the Secret Service. She's saying that she is the reason that uh, Donald Trump was shot. And she's saying that the Secret Service's chief's goal of increasing the number of female agents to 30%, you know, somehow led to non-qualified women being hired and it's because of their lack of qualifications, blah, blah, blah. We know the whole story. So white women seemingly have as much to lose in this attack on DEI as, you know, black folks, Latinos, Asians, and others. But we also know that this notion of white women uh, coalescing with mm -hmm. these groups doesn't always work out so well. Yeah, I, when has it worked out well, right? As it relates to you know, them coming to real to to seriously and authentically engage with other communities that don't work, that are not connected to, to to white men, really. Because look at look at 2016, they had a chance to get a white woman in office, and many of them still sided with Trump. You know, majority of elections, Republicans win. Uh, primarily because of the vote of the white woman, even though many of their interests ally more with non-white communities. But I think one of the challenges with many white women is that they can take the benefits of people's other people's fights for equalities and still be able to live in their white world where they still have those privileges. And obviously the classic example of that is affirmative action where you know we all know that statistically white women benefited from it more than other groups, but they'll be the first, some of them will be the first in line and say, get rid of affirmative action when they benefited from policies that, that came from it. And so that's why I've never been really optimistic. I'm hoping that with this election and everything going on as it relates to abortion and the like, that white women will really step up in large numbers that will support, you know, a democratic ticket that can help us start to change some of this direction. But I'm, I'm not, I have to be convinced that this can happen because I've just never seen it. Have you seen Mary Frances, any prominent white women? Uh, and I haven't looked at, you know, everything on social media. I know there are obviously white people who are pushing back on Johnny Taylor, uh, but have you seen prominent white women coming out, pushing back on the attacks on DEI? Um, I have not. And one thing to point out is that oftentimes it's white women who head up human resources in organizations. And so the chief human resource officer is oftentimes a white woman. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, white women in general don't support um, DEI, but we do see, and we do know what happened in 2016 and how the vote went. I don't remember that what the exact percentage, but a large percentage of white women voted for um, voted for Donald Trump. I think it was close to 50 percent. And I I know that um, I have heard in the focus groups and the listening sessions that we do in corporations, um, oftentimes our sisters will say it's the white women who are not who are not supportive. Uh, so I've heard that for years. I've been doing this work for 40 years, and for 40 years. You know, um, and there's a, a book that was written a number of years ago uh, called Our Separate Ways. Um, Stella and Como and um, Ella, Ella Bell wrote the book, um, Our Separate Ways, and talked about, you know, black women and, and white women. So you would think that black women and white women and women of color, you know, um, and white women, you know, could come together and be a part of this coalition. But um, as Dr. Uh, Dabinga says, I, I, I've, not, I've not seen that. I've not seen that happen. Yeah, I remember the 2016 election. What a lot of the focus groups and studies and polls showed is that what you said, Dr. DeBing, although white women may suffer from the elimination of some of these programs, at the end of the day, they see their whiteness as you know being paramount, the primary thing that uh, will allow them to you know enjoy their certain status and privileges in our society. And a lot of them tie their vote to their husbands pocketbook, many believing that if they vote, you know, with their husband choices, i.e. the Republican choices, their taxes will be lower and they'll be able to, you know, drive their bins, live in their comfortable communities and do their charity. 
So, yep. you know, they, they have this kind of, you know, cognitive dissonance where, you know, I'm not really supporting him. What I'm doing is supporting my husband. And by doing so, it gives me more freedom to go out and, you know, care about orphans and, you know. And their kids won't have to compete with a diversifying America. Yes. And they get to support it. But, you know, they can feel good like I gave at the office. Right. They can write a check and say, I, I did do my part. It's a complicated uh, web. Obviously, it's a complicated set of facts and issues that we face in this DEI space. It is not going anywhere. Uh, after the lawsuit was filed against the reparations plan in Evanston, one of those conservative groups literally went on social media and said, if you have a gripe about any policy at your company that you think is favoring minorities, contact our law firm because we will represent you. So there are active uh, litigation law firms, law groups out there recruiting plaintiffs, recruiting people who will be the plaintiffs in lawsuits so that they can challenge uh, DEI programs, whether they're in law firms or accounting firms or venture capitalist firms. So we better wake up <laughs> mm -hmm. and we better figure out how to get ahead of this train because it is moving very, very rapidly in many of us. Uh, we'll find ourselves in the position of losing uh, many of the positions and many of the benefits that we've worked so hard, not just for ourselves, but for our children and for our children's children. So uh, a lot to talk about here. Thank you so much, Mary Frances. Always a pleasure to see you, my friend. I, I knew if anybody would be on top of this, it would be you. So thank you for even bringing this to my attention. And Dr. Domingo, always on point uh, with your insights. Uh, this is a conversation we will continue. Obviously, there is a lot to talk about on this subject. Mary Frances Win Winters and Dr. Omikanga Dabinga, thanks so much for your time.